Let's talk about this score. It's mostly a wondrous, new discovery, fairly optimistic melody, asking, what's over the horizon? More so than, oh, what's over the horizon? But every so often it slips in one of these. It sort of makes you tilt your head and say, maybe there is something over the horizon. And man, is this film beautiful, right from the first frame. I've really got to get to Iceland. This engineer's workout routine. I like mystery. And you know what I like more? A mystery that I have to think about. We never come back to this scene. No one ever says this is exactly what happened. But the answers are there. Ridley Scott himself said this doesn't have to be Earth, but uh, this is Earth. Or the insinuation is at least that this happened on Earth and the engineers created humans through black goo gene manipulation. I mean, they are not messing around with this scenery. I think they want us to come and find them. And so they did. I really love this cut to them shooting through space. Why aren't you helping them? <laughs> they don't want my help. Ah, that explains why Night Owl hung up his cape and cowl in this future. How do you know it's beautiful? Because that's what I choose to believe. And this is really the driving force for Shaw. Where do we go when we die? And then the inverse of that question she's looking to answer in this film, where do we come from? Anti-Washington general's name? Michael Fassbender. You know I love him, but can anyone deny how amazing he is in this film? As an early generation Ash, he rides the line between robotic and human amazingly. I find the pacing of this film so engaging. A bit of an update to the opening of Alien that had long pans around the ship corridors, creeping us out with a cold emptiness of space. The film opens with a mystery, then plants us on Earth for a discovery, and then jumps us into space to slow down with David and toward the ship. If you're one to complain about the Prometheus being way more advanced than the Nostromo, just remember that it was basically a tow truck. If you've watched enough Star Trek, you know that industrial ships are always old and outdated. Prometheus is a top-of-the-line research vessel. Wayland is going to spend a lot more money on eternal life than just collecting resources. And that's really all you need to know about Vickers. Two years of cryo? Should probably do some push-ups. From the introduction of all our main characters, we get a very reminiscent feeling of the original alien. No uniforms, just people living their lives. Except for Vickers, who stands out intentionally. Wayland Corporation. Building better worlds. Literally building better worlds. Now this is the type of holographic tech I can get behind. I am long dead. May I rest in peace. Honoring the dead. Wait. Name is David. He is the closest thing to a son I will ever have. Talk about breaking two bird hearts with one dismissive comment stone. You ain't a boy and you ain't got no soul. Well, that would require the one thing that David will never have, a soul. Wayland is not exactly an unreliable narrator, but his statement stated as fact is the soul, if you will, of this film. We learn so much about David in his opening sequence just through visuals. He's curious about Shaw's dreams, meaning he's interested in her beyond a superficial physical care level. He's attempting to understand humanity through watching movies, and you'll notice he actually spends more time repeating the film dialogue than the super complex language he's learning. This brings up two things for me. First, human emotions and the nuance of human interaction is more difficult for David to learn and understand than simple rote memorization. Second is what we learn about him from the simple fact that he desires to understand human emotion. I'm sure he could imitate it easily, but he practices it. This is a lot of what this film is about. I'll explain more later. Rubik's Cube used to plant the idea in your mind that this movie is less sci-fi horror, more 80s puzzle game. I mean, seriously. But unlike the Rubik's Cube, a lot of it is purposefully unsolvable. I'm really happy to see that Ryan's brother Trey finally got his life together. Just in case you're confused about Vicar's personality, here's some chilly snow to go along with her cold heart. Only if you're breathing through an exhaust pipe. How can you expect anyone to take you seriously when you're still nursing your 12-year-old? Yeah, it wouldn't be any good if I couldn't do that. Ah, Yannick. The secret genius and hero amongst all these smart people. I love how coy he is about just flying the ship. Making you guys pretty close, huh? Not too close, I hope. Ooh, android burn. Who wants to be a human? Questioning your existence and crap. Now, do you think a holographic display would be helpful? Well, Ridley Scott has some choice words for anyone who questions him. Literally, it's in his commentary. I realize it seems a little irresponsible to take your helmet off, but can you blame him? Wouldn't you want to breathe the air on an alien planet? And if you can't trust the android's calculation of safety, who can you trust? Whoa, I totally forgot Benedict Wong was in this. And so skinny. Does this mean he put on all that weight for Marco Polo? Talk about method acting. Maybe I'm more. Maybe it's Martian piss. Nah, you're thinking of Benedict's other movie. Originally, I wondered if Ridley had the plan to make the space jockey from Alien to be wearing a suit that looked like a skeleton, but he admitted it was just some masterful retconning. So, masterful retconning win. No, no I'm, uh, I'm out of here. I'm just a geologist. I like rocks. I love rocks. And this is something that sets the Alien universe apart, something I appreciate. Other than Sean Holloway, the rest of the crew is just there to do a job. That's it. 
The only one who grows and sees the bigger picture is Yannick and his buddies. Just in case it wasn't clear where the snakes came from, this is their original form. There's a lot of confusion about what this room is and what's what. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. What matters is that the black goo is in there and they change the atmosphere by entering. However, I think it's pretty clear that it's a temple or altar room of some kind. Something that has to do with the engineer's religion. The only thing that really matters is what Holloway says. This is just another tomb. It's why he's disappointed and goes back to the ship to get drunk. Bet you didn't even notice the skull on top of the pyramid when they entered, but it was there. Saving your human overlords. We've been here before, Fifield. I don't know. It all looks the same to me. There's a misconception that Fifield is the cartographer or something when he's actually I'm just a geologist. His pups are just from mapping out the rocks, and there's no indication that he has access to the map it's producing. We have a problem as humans when we see advanced tech that we don't understand. We assume it's basically magic and can do everything we dream of. When in reality, it clearly serves only one purpose. Okay, sample is stale, no contagion present. And just like this medical diagnostic machine, it's limited. A more apt readout would have been no known contagion present, or earthly okay. contagion. Clearly, there's a contagion. Think we got it? Tell us ourselves. Static censoring. Fun fact, this was initially an Inception-type dream-sharing scene where David went inside Wayland's head to have this conversation, thus the casting of Guy Pearce to play his younger self. But it was rightfully scrapped to preserve the reveal later. Love how the zoom in on David's skin shows his synthetic fingerprint stamped with the Wayland logo. Why do you think your people made me? We made you because we could. This is what this film is about. Disappointment upon meeting your maker. And to everyone that was upset there were no answers, what answers did you want exactly? The meaning of life? That isn't the point of this film. While I don't agree with the conclusion the film makes, the point it's trying to make is that there is no point. The engineers might as well have created humans for the same reason humans created David. We've already established that Holloway's drunk and why. Obviously David would be sly enough to drop the goo in when he wasn't looking. The finger in the drink was just for our benefit. And as evil as this action may have been, he did technically clear it with Holloway first. What would you be willing to do? Anything and everything. And if you're confused why David infected him at all, you only need to look at this statement. Try. Harder. Once David relays Wayland's message, it becomes clear why he poisons Holloway's drink. Try anything and everything. Kill them all. Who even cares? Wayland wants to prolong his life by any means necessary. As of right now, David thinks the engineers are all dead. So why not try out the black goo on a guy who said he'd do anything? This is Rose. Generosity. Discovering the source of humanity is good for your love life. You, robot. My room. Ten minutes. Sex Turing test? <laughs> Well, that escalated quickly, but it wouldn't be an alien movie without some kind of scientist ignoring all safety precautions or animal warning signs like hissing, <laughs> leading to their ultimate demise. Just ask John Hurt, aka King. Plus, Milburn gets a little bit of leeway since this is the first living thing he, a biologist, has discovered on an alien planet, so he'd expectedly be excited. And Earth snakes don't regrow heads and break bones in seconds, or have acid blood. And that's a hardcore nope. Sick with what? Just do this. I'm suiting up. Apparently Vickers saw how Ripley failed, so she knew to go down and make sure her John Hurt didn't come in. So this is actually an improvement on the events of Alien. It's funny because Ripley was the one that didn't want to let Kane back on board and failed because of Ash. Vickers actually succeeds and we all hate her for it. I guess she didn't have to burn him alive, but he was good with it. Also, self-sacrifice to save your lady and crew. Also, what to say? You're pregnant. I mean, talk about taking the sexual assault that's prevalent throughout the entire Alien franchise and really bringing it to the next level. A woman who can't get pregnant now has something very scary and foreign quickly growing inside her. It's a whole lot of emotions and different levels of terror she'd be going through. To lose Dr. Holloway after your father died under such similar circumstances. Ebola. And with that, we're told to question our assumption about David's curiosity. Messing with our perception and forcing us to project our own traits onto David when maybe he was just gathering information to gain an advantage. This is both an awesome showcase of some fun futuristic tech and also the most tense, terrifying, and vomit-inducing scene in the film. Also brutal. Also nope. This seems like a good time to talk about the black goo. The question comes up as to why he's zombie-ish. Well, he had a unique interaction with the goo. When you ingest it, it breaks you down right to your DNA and beyond. It's safe to infer that this is what's happening to Holloway, just very slowly given the small amount of goo. The worms were submerged in the goo, and their DNA was changed to make them larger, stronger, and with more defense mechanisms, just like Fifield. 
So we know it changes your DNA, which is why it changed, not to get too graphic here, Holloway's genetic material to create something alien inside Shaw's womb. Fifield only had external contacts, so like the worms, just got stronger. And they put it out here in the middle of nowhere because they're not stupid enough to make weapons of mass destruction on their own doorstep. And our hero emerges. There's a deleted scene where Yannick tries to comfort Vickers with a story about his time in the military witnessing a similar outbreak. But even without that, we get the picture that he understands what's going on here. I can't bring none of that shit back home with us. Can't let it happen. I didn't think you had it in you. Sorry. Poor choice of words. <laughs> Robot buns. Doesn't everyone want their parents dead? Your perception is your reality. David wants his parents dead because Wayland sucks. You made it here, and, and it was meant for us. Why? And here are your answers. The only answers you really need. They're not gods, just superior beings that were angered by their experiment of humanity. Pick your reason why. I can't pretend like seeing the giant seat with the space jockey in it from Alien isn't super fulfilling. All due respect, Captain, you're a pilot and you're gonna need all the help you can get. Compliments. Some serious courage and three self-sacrifices. Ah, <sighs> the famous, or is it infamous? Prometheus school of running away from things. Number one, that ship is humongous. So understanding which way it's rolling or knowing that it would continue rolling on end like that would be impossible. Number two, that ship is humongous. Away is the only direction your brain can process when faced with an imminent crushing. And number three, that ship is humongous. Just because we get an aerial view doesn't mean that the tiny humans running away would have any clue how to escape its crash until you were on your back and could sort of tell which way it was falling. It's still a funny joke, but we'd all be dead in this situation. 100% guarantee. Especially movie critic, I mean, Mabel's. What, don't you want to see your baby all grown up? No? That's a big nope. And the first human-born facehugger fulfills its destiny. Where's my cross? I have to say I appreciate that they came back to what she chooses to believe. It should have been evidence enough that we're not supposed to be spoon-fed all the answers. And I'm still searching. This is probably where a lot of people got upset, but I was just excited for the sequel. This film's story is complete. They found their engineers and learned that they wanted to reboot their creation. Mission accomplished. You guys, we swear, this movie has nothing to do with Alien. Prometheus is one of those films that's been analyzed to death, revived, and then analyzed again. So for the handful of you who are still confused or annoyed by plot holes or unanswered questions and didn't spend the hours of research and discussion it took a lot of people to understand this movie, I'll get through the important stuff as briefly as possible. Hopefully lots of your questions were answered in the first part of this video. I can tell you right off the bat that while some things are confusing, there really are no plot holes in this film. Some things are left open to interpretation, but most of it is surprisingly straightforward. Probably the biggest clue to what this film is about is the name given to the moon, LV-223. Not 426, 223. Or Leviticus 22.3. The chapter in the Bible has to do with God giving Moses some guidelines about sacred and sacrificial offerings. Verse 3 says that anyone who is unclean and comes near the sacred offerings will be cut off from God. The obvious parallel with the engineers confirms they were planning to cut humanity off for being unclean. Again, pick your reason. And in the Bible, separation from God is death. There was an entire plot line that Ridley scrapped about Jesus being an engineer and being humanity's last chance at redemption and instead humanity crucified him. That's why Shaw dates the dead engineer at around 2,000 years, give or take. And crucifying engineer Jesus is why they're coming to destroy humanity. I'm glad it was scrapped because it's way too on the nose, but it leaves behind an interesting distinction. Right from the first scene, we learn an important lesson about the engineers. They are willing to sacrifice themselves to create life and it would be safe to assume protect life. So of course, hearing that Wayland is cheating death and looking for extended life while robbing his progeny of her rightful place would anger them. And then we circle back again to the Jesus imagery of sacrifice as Yannick and his crew lay down their lives for all of humanity, complete with a crucifixion pose. There are some things that don't have clear explanations, but based on their context, we can make some educated guesses. The head. This is an altar room. It clearly plays into whatever religion the engineers practice, which seems to be centered around the xenomorphs. Is it really just the AVP plotline? Humans are created to be hosts for xenomorphs? I don't think so. I like to think this will be explored more going forward, but even if not, I don't really need to know. And it definitely doesn't matter for this story. Having watched both the writers and Ridley Scott's commentary, there's something that's important to know about Prometheus. The first is that, while there are answers in the minds of the filmmakers, they had no intention of telling the audience what they were in this film. They want you to come up with your own theories and truths. 
At least that's what Damon Lindelof said. I don't think Ridley really cares what we think, he just makes good movies. But they'd rather challenge you than spell everything out. And based on the numerous videos and thousands of Reddit comments, I'd say they succeeded. The second is that a sequel has been planned from the beginning. So at some point they are going to let us in on their plan. So the open-ended questions never really bothered me. It was always clear there would be a sequel based on the ending. For the record, and to be fair I guess, I'm still holding out hope for a Pandorum sequel. Fingers crossed. Also still waiting for District 10, or District 9 too. Or District 9, Christopher Johnson, please come back! Come on Blomkamp. We all want it. Chappie was fine, but seriously, write that crap. What was I saying? Right. Beyond that, everything I cared about was in there, and it's still a complete story. You know me well enough by now to know that the answers to the questions aren't nearly as important to me as what the questions were trying to say or ask. Inception isn't great because the top was or wasn't spinning. It's great because it didn't matter. The main theme running throughout this film, and the one thing that ties protagonists and antagonists together, is that of parentage. From an existential standpoint of who made me. On to actual biological, or in David's situation, mechanical slash engineerical, who's your daddy? It's the driving force behind Vickers who desires to replace a king in Shaw's quest to find out why she was made the way she was, and then by the end, why they wanted to destroy them. And ultimately, this film is about the disappointment of learning their creators are just as fallible as them. We made you because we could. But I appreciate that the film doesn't try to answer the questions of the universe. It's sort of a point. And who made them? There will always be hope for Shaw because she has faith. But it's what I choose to believe. David doesn't have to question anything. He knows his creator and knows Holloway's statement to be true since Waylon has made that clear. Not to get all nerdy on you, but the Star Trek Next Gen episode Measure of a Man is a great exploration of these concepts. In Roddenberry's universe, there were at least some people who acknowledged the possibility that Data had a soul. The crew of the Prometheus, and by extension all of Scott's universe version of humanity, see David as nothing more than a tool. To be fair, they haven't actually identified him as AI, but come on. He's asking questions, seems to be making choices, and having subtle emotional responses. Even Data couldn't do that without his emotion chip. But this is one of two ideas presented about David that are left purposefully vague. As I've been pointing out, I think the humans severely underestimate David's capacity for human emotion. He clearly understands it, but they still assume he can't experience it. He claims... Want. Not a concept I'm familiar with. But that was just to dodge a question. He deceives and manipulates everyone throughout the film, so I do believe he understands want. And as advanced as he is, I think he learned enough about the engineers to know the exact outcome of showing the very unclean Wayland to the engineer and asking for his eternal life. He does indeed want their parents dead. I didn't. This head tilt in question right here. Casualties, Mom. Has anyone died? Not 15 minutes into the film tips us off that he's more than meets the eye. Does he have more humanity than Vickers, who so cavalierly dismisses the potential death of one of 17 crewmates a casualty? Or worse, was she talking about her father? Probably, since she doesn't care when he does die. You could say that David has purposefully shown comforting Shaw to give us the stark juxtaposition of Vickers and David right off the bat. Or maybe it's just programming. David is the key to understanding the relationship between humans and their creators. And he's a shiny example of just why the engineers would want to destroy humanity. And Fastbender kills it. He's such a great cast, I can't wait to see him in Covenant. One complaint I'm honestly not sure why I didn't read more of were the echoes and similarities to the original Alien. I mean, it's bound to happen with the same director. But I just watched this back to back with Alien and you thought The Force Awakens was a reboot? From the ship, to the basic plot structure, to the ulteriorly motivated android, right down to the shape of the corridors and some straight up quoted dialogue. I won't get into it, but watch it, you'll see what I mean. This film is loaded with so much stunning imagery. You can never say Ridley Scott doesn't know how to show you some spectacle. The landscapes and inner workings of the temple and ship and the amazingly detailed holographic imagery that David interacts with. Everything in this film is beautiful or disgustingly beautiful, and I love that you can spot this film a mile away with its blue and yellow color palette. And the entire cast was great. For having a pretty stereotypical role in this film, Idris Elba raises the cliché almost to Tom Skerritt's Dallas level. Numi Rapace was really amazing throughout the film. She proved she's much more than a scary punk girl with dragon tattoos but she got to really show off her physical acting ability in the final third. I absolutely believe she had something evil rattling around inside her, just as much as John Hurt in the original. And Charlize Theron carried her ice-cold demeanor without coming off as one note. I'll always be happy to see more entries in this franchise, so I'm looking forward to Covenant. The idea that all of this, the entire Alien franchise, was kicked off by humans is also a really interesting touch, especially in a film about human origins. This film is truly underrated. I liked it right from the first time I saw it, even without really grasping all of its complexities. My hope is that Ridley ignored all the hate for this film and didn't turn Alien Covenant into a schlockfest. Nothing against Cameron's aliens, but I've always found the original Alien to be far superior. Anyway, next week I'm finally delivering on something I promised. Yeah.